I wanted to talk a little bit about kind of how things are evolving in uh, uh, the threat landscape. What we know that Microsoft four and a half years ago uh, joined OIN, uh, also purchased GitHub, uh, and the monolithic threat that did exist is now different. Now they become the prodigal. Uh, they are friendly to a, to a fault, uh, supportive. In fact, I probably spent more time during COVID with Microsoft than anyone else, and uh, including family, I would say. And so it's a, uh, it's a, a strange turn of events, but I'm incredibly welcoming of the relationship and of the partnership that we forged. Uh, and there's more to do. And, and uh, I know that Microsoft will be there supportive of doing more with us. And so that's a, it's a comforting thing. And I think, uh, you know, there are many uh, companies in this community that are, uh, uh, I tell Jim this all the time, Jim Zemlin, but um, there's lots of people here that have been around for a long time doing things and working in open source, but uh, uh, the level of energy that we see from certain companies uh, that are newer, like Microsoft and Huawei as a couple that are, people might be surprised by that don't follow this carefully in terms of the number of contributions back, the activity level, the number of projects participated in are, uh, are really uh, quite uh, encouraging to see the, their, their participation, their energy, their enthusiasm, the quality of people they connect with uh, the open source projects in which they participate, whether it be projects here Finley LF or Malinkovich's projects or, or others that are out there. So um, we are a, a service organization. We don't have any uh, uh, funding model other than equity, and we don't really get much equity investment. Uh, we've uh, had six original investors, IBM, Red Hat, Novell at the time, which was SUSE, Sony, NEC, and Philips. And, uh, We've had Toyota and Google join in the last uh, six years, seven years, and uh, they contribute $20 million each. Uh, we've never charged for anything else that we've ever done. Uh, we work behind the scenes a lot to, uh, to deal with situations. I'll talk about some of the situations that we've dealt with most recently, uh, and uh, I'll call it uh, the, uh, uh, the elephant in the room. Uh, as there are lots of companies that are really committed to open source and, are, and do so in a, in a wonderful way, uh, understand the, 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 the notion of obligation and opportunity and how they go hand in hand. Um, I think there's a social component. It is a social movement, in fact, it just happens to produce technology. But the idea of collaborative development is so important and fundamental that it's what I think about. It's my swing thought, if I, if I can say it that way, uh, every day is to I'm looking to have a profound positive impact on people's ability to make good choices, to choose whatever solution they want, uh, to work on ever, whatever project they want, to allocate resources in whatever way they choose to be able to support uh, new novelty that we can all benefit from. And uh, I'm uh, the closest thing to a guardian angel that the community has, and I love that role because that's, uh, that's what I did when I was in government. I worked for the State Department for 14 years uh, until the wall came down, which was my swing thought then, uh, is seeing, uh, seeing the people of Eastern Europe be, and Central Europe be free to make their own choices about governance. Uh, and uh, this is the capstone on my career. That was the first 14 years. This is the last 15, 16 years. Um, and, uh, this is something that I love to do, uh, and I love to support organizations like the LF because very much I live in the slipstream of what they do. Uh, they put up projects. In the beginning, it was Linux, and it was a half dozen other projects, and uh, that was 17 years ago. Uh, I had a series of conversations with Jim, and he was telling me about his, what his vision was. And uh, we were, we had probably 31 licensees uh, the first two and a half or three years of our existence, uh, six of those being the original funding members. And so this wasn't looking like uh, a uh, grand slam. It was looking like mm, maybe this wasn't such a good idea. So I was brought in to determine over a three year period whether this would be relevant and important to the community uh, or whether this would just be uh, 
an experiment that didn't really pan out. Um, and so now we have 3,800 members. Uh, it's the largest patent cross-license in the history of technology. Uh, and um, in no small measure, it's because Jim had the ambition to uh, enable professional management, uh, uh, both on the finance side as well as the operational side, uh, to, uh, to uh, nurture um, uh, open source growth and to do it under permissive licenses which meant that the GPL v3 wouldn't be used on any of these new projects that came about uh, on, on his watch. Uh, and so GPL v3 is the only license that actually has really strong patent provisions, but uh, they were too strong for most, most of the large patent holding companies, and so it was almost universally rejected. Um, and so by using permissive licenses, which have notoriously weak patent provisions and protections, it created an opportunity for OIN's relevance to occur. And so by living in the slipstream, a project is launched, technology is produced, code is released, uh, what's core, what's fundamental that people need to use and need freedom of action, freedom to operate around, and want to be able to adopt without fear of litigation, that's what we include in the cross-license. And the idea was that it's universal reciprocity. I'll talk about this concept um, because it's very important to me and it's, uh, it's under a little bit of threat right now uh, because of the actions of what I'll call the inauthentic. Uh, I won't name those companies, but they're not part of our community. And they're large companies that have uh, very strong histories of monetization um, that uh, for those of you who don't know how you know, the patent system works, uh, most of the patents are written down to zero so that they don't have any, uh, uh, they, don't, they don't go against your, um, they go against your budget to some degree in terms of they have operating management costs, ongoing fees for renewal or for su sustainability. But generally they're written down so that if you monetize a patent, it's liquid EBITDA. Uh, it's like mercury. It just slides around and, and then drops to the bottom line. And there's nothing better because you're not putting a lot of people on it. You've got some people that work in the IP department doing monetization. Um, and this is why pools are so important to some of these companies, particularly the companies in the telecom space that have you know, MPEG LA and all manner of pooling cyst situations that have allowed them to generate revenue, which I don't have any particular problem with. What I have a problem with is when those companies, uh, as part of their agenda to uh, slow or stall the progress of Linux or manage open source in a way that isn't always productive and constructive for innovation, um, that's a problem. Uh, and when I see uh, uh, these companies uh, pretending to be uh, good citizens of open source. Um, I just wonder how many people actually are taken in by them um, and why people continue to work for them. Um, one of the things that Microsoft talked about was OIN being a litmus test for authenticity to allow them to hire better people. To, to, I think um, a quote from someone who's famous in the community to me once was that there are 35 million coders in the world, there are 3,000 that matter. Um, get some of those 3,000 to support your projects. I already did the, uh, the, the Microsoft comments, Dave, so it's, it's over. <laughs> uh, and uh, anyway, it's, a, uh, it's an interesting world, but our problems are shifting and morphing a bit, and I'll talk about how they're changing. And so I'm, I borrowed some slides from the LF since I'm speaking at an LF event. This is one that, that uh, Mike Dolan shows and uh, uh, some of the other team members. This is no surprise to anyone. It's happening and it continues to happen. And it's, uh, uh, there's so many industries that we have to chase because uh, open source is expanding so dramatically in terms of adoption. Uh, I can remember uh, conversations with the auto companies uh, 10, 12 years ago. And it was like, uh, yeah, we're not so interested. We don't use open source. I've heard this from literally thousands. I've met with over 4,400 uh, IP directors at organizations around the world. Uh, and, uh, and there are a lot more to go. 
Um, these are the gatekeepers, the people who make the decisions around what, uh, what can be done with the patent portfolio and very important in, in determining whether to participate in OIN and, and uh, make their patents subject to the, uh, the cross-license obligations. And so uh, uh, OIN brings me to CTOs, to deputy CTOs, to heads of software, increasingly heads of hardware as we think about uh, the, the innovation and, and innovations in hardware that are emerging because of uh, uh, the, uh, the advent of open source and its importance uh, in the hardware space. And so uh, we look at where projects are going, projects that are producing significant amounts of code. Uh, not, not all LF projects, by the way. There are thousands of projects that we ultimately support. Um, and hundreds that have significant amounts of code that are part of our cross-license obligation zone. Um, and so everybody understands that open source is blowing up. It continues to blow up. Software is, is increasingly important. Uh, hardware, uh, again, is becoming increasingly important and influenced by, by an open source model. Um, OAN, as I was describing earlier, um, was formed by these original six companies, and then Toyota and Google came along, uh, and uh, our, we don't have any funding model. The license is free, uh, whether you're a company that owns 60 or 80,000 patents, like Microsoft or like Canon, in the latter case of 80,000, one of the largest patent holding, patent holding, patent holding companies in the world, um, and uh, there are just millions of patents that are encumbered as part of the OIN license. Now, there's a difference between the word encumber and actually licensed. Um, there are six, whatever it was, 62,000 patents when Microsoft signed the OIN license. They're probably like 55,000 now, I would think. The number's probably coming down. Um, and uh, uh, those were all encumbered, but only based on the, the cross license actually is driven by the, the the zone, what we call the Linux system definition, which is the functionality uh, that comes from core uh, technology, core code that's released by major projects and minor projects. Um, and there's a, a list of Linux system packages on our website. Uh, every patent we own, uh, we used to own a lot of patents. Um, patents that read on Microsoft that, uh, that we could forward deploy to companies at risk or uh, in litigation. We used to attack a lot of poor quality applications. Uh, many of those were Microsoft applications. Um, and uh, under the, pre the American Events Act, <clears throat> there are all kinds of things we did and our world was focused so much on, uh, uh, on uh, one little, you know, one little part of the world in the, the Pacific Northwest. Um, and uh, I remember the first time that I suggested that I could go and visit Microsoft, uh, uh, my board members from IBM were like, are you kidding? Why would you go visit them? I said, because you kind of start with a detente and then you move in the direction of, of finding things that you actually agree on. And there are more things that we agreed on than, than most people would have perceived, but um, it's just an evolution uh, of, for any company. And it's just one that was particularly important for me because uh, it was one of the, one of the goals was to, uh, to reduce the noise in the system, the FUD that was out there, and also reduce the real risks that are represented by the ownership of patents in the hands of companies that were uh, antagonistic to the growth of open source at one point in their history. Um, and everybody kind of at some point recognized the inevitability of open source, the value of it to them and their interdependencies, uh, which is really where we are now. We're in a, in a situation where um, the threat from operating companies is in decline. A lot of operating company patents uh, have been sold off in the secondary, into the secondary market. And uh, uh, patent assertion entities are more concerning now to me than operating companies. I mean, there are uh, operating companies that are concerning, but for different reasons, and I'll go through some of those. Anyway, OIN has spent $100 million on patents. We will do whatever is necessary, and our capital is, is uh, we still have, I think, $27, 28000000 million in capital. Uh, and so uh, we're a skirmisher. Um, we, uh, we don't take uh, uh, attacks lying down. Um, 
if there's a situation that requires attention and action, we are um, more than likely, um, I'll hop on a plane and I'll, I'll deal with it face to face with people because I'm, uh, as I said, this is a, this is a, uh, it's a mission for me. It's not a, it's a calling. It's not about, uh, you know, a job where I punch a clock either in my mind or, or actually. It's a job that never ends. Um, and I'm, I'm always available to people who, who have challenges that they're facing. Um, and, uh, and no matter, you know, when it is and, and what it is, uh, uh, we like to solve problems and we work very closely with the community, with the LF, the legal group, with Dolan. Um, there's not a week that goes by that I don't talk to Dolan. Uh, there's probably not a week that goes by I don't talk to Jim. Uh, as well, and uh, you know, all kinds of other projects that we're con closely connected with, uh, project management organizations, uh, the technical leads for a variety of projects uh, are our, are the source of new content for our the, to expand the scope of our our cross license. Um, there's never been a license like this in the history of of licensing of patenting. Um, You'll never find a situation where a patent licensor has the ability to unilaterally expand the scope of the license without approval of the licensee um, and not have people kind of running for the hills uh, and trying to abandon their obligations. Uh, but we have sustained this, this licensing community and grown it because people trust that we will be a caretaker of their interests by expanding not into the appropriately proprietary technologies that they covet and the, which drive their, their, in some cases, their d differentiation in the market, but rather we will expand it to include that which is absolutely essential that they rely on and they need to build on top of uh, in order to, uh, to be able to grow um, their, their differentiation uh, and building up from their open source platforms and, and uh, distributions. And so, uh, we have 3,300 packages. We'll probably be close to 4,000 packages by the end of the year. Um, uh, we have, this is the 12th update of the Linux system definition that we've undertaken in my uh, 15 and a half years at OIN. So we're very active in trying to keep up with the pace of technology. Uh, that initial curve is something that we think about all the time. Where is the new growth occurring? What technologies are being developed? What code is absolutely you know, critical or core? Uh, um, the the uh, OpenStack was a project that we supported and we still support. Um, and they did a great thing for us by determining, designating what's core, what's developmental, what's incubated. Um, we wish more projects would do that, but I think it's actually you know, something that's easily discernible if you actually have a good dialogue with the uh, with the technical leads uh, or the project heads, because many project heads are very technical, uh, like an AGL or, or other projects that, that I see here where we have very close relationships. And so we're 3,800 plus and growing. Um, we are very proud of the fact that uh, we have uh, good distribution around the world. Uh, this is not a, a U.S. activity. This is a global activity. And when I first came in, I think we had 6% uh, of, uh, of OIN licensees were, were in uh, uh, Asia Pacific. And uh, I have spent uh, thousands and thousands of, uh, of miles of travel um, going to China, going to, uh, to kind of be there in the last seven years for their incredible rapid growth of adoption of open source and participation in, in uh, projects here at the LF and elsewhere. Um, have very, very close relationships with many of the companies uh, in uh, Asia Pacific. And, and clearly we've been working on not only with uh, in greater China, but also with Japan and Korea where we have many licensees. Uh, South and Central America, we work with all manner of companies there to ensure that we're not just North American focused, um, and uh, Europe and Middle East and Africa. I mean, I, I talk to the, the people at, uh, in, in the European Commission about this all the time, that you have lots of sources of innovation there, even though they like to claim that uh, uh, the U.S. Is, uh, is eating their lunch. The reality is that 
that you just don't have the large companies, but you have many, many, many developers there, coders, and very sophisticated uh, business models that just doesn't don't happen to ring the bell in the way that uh, that some of the the uh, the ambition-based companies. And I'm I'm adding Microsoft to the list of ambition-based companies now because I see they're going to be a power gener power distri distributor, uh, which is really interesting to me. But that's it's a good sign because. You know, Baidu, Ali, and Tencent, and uh, and Google, and uh, Meta, and uh, uh, and Amazon are, are companies that I look at and say they'll disintermediate anybody. Uh, they don't care what what people would consider to be their core business. They're going to regrow a, a business and utilize technology, you know, largely open source technology, to become something else uh, and to uh, and to participate in a way that the incumbents. Uh, uh, are not prepared to do to be able to uh, to create interesting market share and profitability. This is just an example of the kinds of companies. Again, with 3,800 companies, it would uh, it would be an eye chart. Uh, but just to give you a sense of the diversity of companies, um, we have pretty much of the 26 car and truck companies in China. I think we have 19 of them. Uh, and we have pretty much every major uh, auto company in the world. We're now spending a lot of time on trucking companies and, uh, and broad, more broadly transportation companies that are increasingly adopting open source. Um, and so in a year or so, you'll see five or six or 10 or 12 companies from that space, and then we'll grow that to the, the 44 of the major trucking companies that exist around the world. Uh, and have those uh, all part of our community as well. Um, uh, the uh, hardware is an area that's very uh, important to me, and it's something that I'm, uh, I'll talk a little bit about later. Uh, but we're focused uh, on understanding uh, hardware company needs and, and looking at the future uh, because of, of open source programs like, uh, and projects like RISC-V. Uh, we have embedded companies, fintech companies, all manner of banks, uh, most of the, uh, of the money center banks in the world and many of the super regionals in North America and uh, increasingly banks in uh, regional banks and national banks in, uh, in Europe as well. We have some in Japan. Uh, industrials, uh, when I first met with uh, I think uh, Komatsu, I was really taken seven, seven or so years ago when they, they described their plan for how software was going to change their business. Caterpillar is much the same roadmap if you look at them. Um, and then, you know, energy is a big thing for us. We're, if I look at the three or four industries that will be growing in the next uh, uh, five years, energy will be definitely one of them, uh, along with uh, uh, expanding the industrial sector, uh, precision manufacturing. Um, and this is a, it's an LF slide, but it's basically just shows you what we see when we see what the LF's doing. We're looking at these various spaces and thinking, you know, these are areas as they grow up and mature, as they get to, you know, three, four, five years in from project launch, uh, we start to look at what we can do and what technology is coming out. Uh, what code has been uh, been uh, uh, dropped in the various projects, and we look at supporting the the code and supporting the people that are utilizing the code, the companies that are utilizing the code, to ensure that there's a patent no fly zone around each of these uh, in these these sectors. Um, and this is, I think, this is an important slide because it's it's really about impact. It's it's managing projects is one thing, but the LF takes it to the next level and wants to be accountable uh, to the organizations that have, have you know, like Toyota. Uh, without Toyota, automotive grade Linux would never exist. And there, I feel a burden to Toyota because they're one of my members and they invested in OIN, but I also feel it to, to them as a member, as the founding member of automotive grade Linux, to make sure that every company that participates in automotive grade Linux is part of the OAN community, so that they are their investment is supported by uh, patent protection as well, and it really is like that with every uh, 
uh, every significant uh, project that we deal with and the, and the original uh, investors in those projects, making sure that they, their investment is preserved by the effort we put in to ensure there's, a again, this patent no-fly zone uh, by including core technology that comes out of the project and continuing to, to layer on additional technology that is uh, fundamental to, uh, to the, the adopters of, uh, uh, of, the, of the project and the utilize, those who utilize the technology. Um, and at the bottom, you know, the risk five, as I mentioned before, I think we see uh, the potential for incredible growth. Um, when I was at Motorola in the 90s, uh, we invested in a company called Transmeta, which we believed at that time was going to be the, the answer to, um, to this, the, part, the idea of hardware, software, co-design, and simulation, and breaking the, uh, uh, the kind of anti-innovation agenda that we see in, uh, uh, in, in the silicon. Um, and the idea that we would we all have to build around generic uh, silicon rather than being able to uh, have short run production that's high yield that allows us to customize what our to to our needs. I tell uh, uh, auto companies now that if they're not you know active doing this already, that they will be taping out their own chips in five years. Uh, and I think Toyota, to their credit, is already working and has a relationship with one of their, their traditional suppliers to actually work on their behalf as a, as a uh, research and development, externalized research and development arm to be able to support their utilization of uh, Renaissance to be able to, uh, to tape out their, own, their chips through, through Renaissance. And I think that's a trend that I expect that we'll be seeing over and over again. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the LF, does what it does, manages projects professionally, brings, br brings up new projects all the time. I think the pace of growth is quite amazing. Um, and then we're basically living in the slipstream. Uh, they're enabling ubiquity of open source and we're then ensuring the freedom of action uh, so that people don't feel uncomfortable in the way that they did when OIN was uh, in, in 07 and 08. It was not a, a given that large companies were interested in adopting open source in, sig in a significant way. Um, the, uh, I want to talk about the, how threat is changing. Um, and so we're beyond the era of monolithic threat. There aren't a lot of operating companies that don't get how open source is beneficial to them and important to them. And as a result, it creates a disincentive to uh, bad behavior. That's not true for all companies. Um, their patent assertion entities don't have a business model other than to monetize. And so they acquire patents and then they sue or they threaten to sue. And their whole goal is to, uh, is to extract revenue on behalf of the, the uh, from the, the assets that they've acquired. Very rarely do they develop the patents. What they do is they monetize. Um, and then what I'll call the rise of the inauthentic. This is what I described before, for those of you who weren't here uh, at the beginning, is that um, they're patent monetizers. And monetization is not something I have a great problem with because we have most, some of the most significant monetizers uh, in, the, in the history of, of technology that are part of the OIN community and have signed on to the obligation of the cross license. Um, the problem I have, I mean, you look at uh, AT&T, the most significant cross license, the most significant monetizer in, in the, uh, the, the carrier space. By, I mean, other companies are, are just, just give up the ghost. AT&T is the only company that does it well in that space and is significant, has significant revenue. The others are mainly wasting the time of their senior leadership, uh, thinking that they're some one day going to hit it rich and break, generate billions of dollars in revenue. Um, and then you know, IBM, Sony, Philips, these are... That's four of the most significant monetizers in history, four of the top 10. Um, and you know, Microsoft played with monetization for a while and then realized it was not interesting, uh, not relevant, and not worth uh, the, uh, uh, the damage that they cause in the marketplace. Um, even Google had a monetization unit that they'd brought over from, uh, 
from uh, Motorola that uh, was doing monetization for three or four years. Um, and uh, ultimately, they decided that was clearly not something that was consistent with how they wanted to utilize patents, uh, and they moved out of that. But there are companies that, uh, that are monetizers that uh, recognize the importance of open source to some degree, uh, but not sufficiently to be able to overcome uh, the crack cocaine effect that, uh, that monetization really generates. Because it is all pure EBITDA, it is so powerful, so important at the end of a quarter when you haven't had a great quarter, even if you've had a decent quarter and you want to make it better. You want to feel something richer. You know, it's like flowing through your veins, something that's just so pure that you're like, wow, this is special. Um, and it's hard to, to, to wean yourself from that. Uh, it is highly addictive. And as a result, we have a number of companies that are in the community that are always involved and they have lots of capital that they put out to be to stay involved in the community community. They're on boards. They may even be on the LF board. Um, and uh, the thing is that there, there's a civil wars are, are raging inside these companies where the tech people get it and want to be good citizens of the community. And for the most part, the tech side is. Uh, but then they've got other countervailing interests around monetization because for the most part, they live on the wrong side of history. They're in a challenged position because their core business has changed and open source is probably changing it um, not for the good unless they recognize what they need to do. I mean, you look at, you know, you look at the efforts of Intel to, uh, you know, who would have thought they would have a, uh, you know, a TSMC like foundry business that they would spin up. And, you know, that, that takes a lot, of, uh, a lot of awareness to recognize how important the growth of, of RISC-V is and, and how open source hardware can really have a, a significant effect on their core business going forward. And uh, so I applaud them for that. And I, I, you know, it'll be interesting to see what happens. But, um, you know, and TSMC, after all these years, is actually really well positioned to, uh, to get a lot of not only Chinese uh, uh, industrial business, but, but get a lot of opportunities from, from Western companies as well that want to have their, t their chips uh, produced by them. Um, and so it's a, um, it's a really challenging environment when, when you're facing potential disintermediation um, by technology that's very different than what you grew up with. I think telecommunications equipment suppliers, they were originally, we used to talk about it as the, the seven central office switch makers. Well, that, that number is different now, two maybe. Uh, and companies that used to be in that business or you know, that are surviving like NEC uh, are surviving because they recognize that they had to move on. Um, because it's not going to be there. It's not something they can harvest, even with no matter what the country does, your country does to preserve opportunities for you, you just can't survive in that business when it's increasingly software-centric and you have a hardware mindset. And so you have these companies that are involved in, in, in you know, trying to be authentic in some part, but then ultimately being inauthentic because they are involved in uh, manipulating circumstances. They will work on IP policies and projects and gather votes so that they, they cripple the, IP po the people who are trying to create an IP policy that's actually productive and constructive. So they create this neutralization effect uh, and also in the process retard innovation. And so that's something that's the elephant in the room to me and not talked about a lot, but uh, they're, you know, again, why people to continue to work at these companies when there's incredible demand. Um, you know, I can see it in, in Sweden or in Finland where you don't have as much mo mobility of people and you want to continue to live in an environment um, that is, you know, where your, your grandparents lived and your great-grandparents and where your, your, your family is. Um, you know, Americans live with this rootlessness, and so it's like, you know, the rest of the rest of our our prehistory didn't exist. And so, um, one of the things that we're doing uh, is, and we've done with Microsoft, is organize a um, 
uh, a community-based uh, solution uh, where we brought together Microsoft and IBM and a bit of poetic justice, uh, as well as Linux Foundation, which is actually putting real money into this and, and, and us uh, to found and fund the open source zone, uh, uh, which is uh, a way of attacking poor quality already granted patents to ensure that they are neutralized um, uh, by being invalidated. And this process is managed for us by Unified Patents, which is uh, the largest uh, 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 entity in the world that does inter parte reviews and ex parte reviews to attack poor quality patents and neutralize their, their, uh, their potentially negative effects. There are other organizations, RPX, LotNet, and AST, that periodically will work with to support open source uh, goals uh, and freedom. But Unified is, is a major partner now, and uh, literally hundreds of patent families have been invalidated um, of patents that, are, that uh, were are relevant to open source. And we'll continue to do this work with them. The pat this is a little background on the patent troll issue. Um, and so 88% uh, 80, of all uh, high-tech litigation is, uh, is actually promulgated by trolls utilizing patents that were largely developed by operating companies. The system, the feed, the feeding, the feedstock comes from operating companies. Um, the longer, the more operating companies we bring in to OIN though, the more of those patents will, will be power, powerless against the people in our community because they will be conveyed, but they'll be conveyed with an encumbrance of the OAN license uh, as we get more and more operating companies to sign. And there are many thousands of patents that are owned by trolls now that can't be used against people in our community. Uh, this is getting it to uh, something relevant. It's not just what is the big picture, but uh, what's happening with litigation. And the, the 2022 numbers are about right. 2023 was very much on target with that. So we didn't see incredible growth, but between, you know, if you look at 2018 till now, there's a very decided trend toward an uptick in litigation against, uh, against uh, utilizing open source related uh, uh, patents. Um, and this is just an example of some of the companies. These are not entities you will likely have heard of, but some of these are well-funded. Uh, some of them are just nuisance players that want to collect $20,000 or $30,000 every time they sue someone and they are serial litigants like Rothschild uh, is on this list. And so, and I just want to say Eclipse has nothing to do with Mike Milinkovic. That's, they just happen to use that name, but it is not at all related to the, to, uh, uh, the Eclipse Foundation. But there are another hundred like that that have patents that relate to open source. Uh, they may not have thousands of patents or hundreds of patents, but there are patents out there that, are, uh, that relate to open source that large companies, operating companies, realized they could never use, but nonetheless, they sold off. And as I said, many of those patents, uh, if you're attacked by, uh, by a, uh, in, you're litigated against uh, for uh, uh, patent infringement, um, you should come to us to understand whether those patents actually might be ones that are covered under a cross-license. Um, and this is an example of some of the projects that uh, this partnership that we have with Unified, uh, some of the projects that have been benefited and uh, where uh, patents that read on, uh, on code that's been released by these projects uh, was involved. Uh, the, what I also want to talk about is the second part of this, the rise of the inauthentic, and I use a specific example um, that I'll notionalize a little bit. Um, but um, OAN's model relies on something called universal reciprocity, and it's uh, sacrosanct to me. And so uh, even though it's probably an unintended consequence of some of these, uh, of the inauthentic in their, their at attempts to prevent universal reciprocity from applying as part of an IP policy of individual projects. Um, uh, essentially, you are conveying what you have and you're receiving what other people have and you're agreeing that you won't sue each other on functional to functionality that's included in what's called the Linux system definition, which is the cross-license zone. So any patents you have that read on, on that 
code and the functionality that's captured in the code, you can't use. You're new, we're neutralizing those patents so everybody benefits that's part of the community. Um, and so um, uh, the Alliance for Open Media has, uh, uh, and many, many other uh, companies, because of uh, OIN utilizing universal reciprocity and it being declared in 2011, at the time of the CPTN transaction, which was a sale of patents by uh, SUSE. Um, we were declared to be a pro-competitive platform and to have the right to license all the patents from CPTN out into the future, which is very in interesting reading uh, of, uh, of, of how broad-based OIN's capacity for licensing, even after patents have been sold by a licensee. Uh, which, which Suse was at the time and still is. And so this notion of universal reciprocity uh, is used by the Alliance for Open Media to support this basic notion that we have opportunities that are unrivaled to be able to capture uh, co-developed uh, technology uh, where lots of smart people are coming together to create, to break down the, the traditional model of, of siloed development to now have smart people from all over the world um, being able to participate in open source development through collaborative activities. Um, and so um, we have all of that happening um, and we have this obligation. We tend to forget about this. But for me, it's very important. Accountability is uh, incredibly important. We have opportunity and we have obligation. And the obligation is we need to, we need to be in compliance. We need to have governance programs in place. Uh, we need to rec res respect uh, inventorship uh, and understand what the copyright obligations are. And OIN has developed really a set of norms or a code of conduct as to what's acceptable in how we use patents in an increasingly open source centric world. Um, and we have 3,800 plus companies. We'll have 5,000, uh, I would expect, uh, by the end of 2025 um, because of the rate of growth uh, of open source and uh, us living in that slipstream of growth. Um, and so uh, the notion that if you want to be able to use, this is the, what the, the uh, in AOM uh, for AV1, which is the free codec. If you want to use the free codec, you have to sh license the patents you have to whomever else is utilizing that codec and they have to do the same to you. So it, it takes a page out of the OIN uh, model. Um, and I think it's a very good thing to emulate. And it's a good obligation because what it does is then require that it, it, it tamps down the possibility of litigation. Uh, it prevents us from having to deal with, with someone that's attempting to uh, come to us with a pool and say, oh, well, you're going to have to pay. I mean, there's a pool that an entity called CISVEL has that it hasn't done any licensing, but they've collected patents and obligations for patents from uh, probably eight to 10 uh, companies that have codec patents um, that are looking to be able to monetize when, when this project, it's not that, that AV1 has massive market share, but it is having a significant effect uh, nonetheless. On, uh, uh, Charles River did a, a study which shows that it's had a 45% downward effect on pricing uh, for all the other proprietary codecs which is quite significant, even though they, they have, as I said, a relatively small percentage of market share. Um, and these companies that are, that are behind, working behind the scenes to try and get the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, competition authorities in Europe to, uh, to uh, misunderstand how OIN, the OIN model works and what universal reciprocity is and thereby uh, misunderstand and misconstrue the goals and effect of, uh, of the policy that is as administrated by the Alliance for Open Media. They're claiming that it's inherently anti-competitive um, to require someone to convey their uh, a patent license if the, to everyone else in the, in the community of companies utilizing that product and that technology. Uh, and uh, they're claiming that the requiring of the conveyance of patents 
um, as a quid pro quo for adoption is antagonistic to innovation because patents equal innovation, which is an absolutely ridiculous uh, and preposterous view that is held by many, many people. Um, in fact, uh, I was just with DG Grow, uh, which does all of the, um, the normalization of, of policy across the European Union. Um, they, are, they face this every day with uh, their constituents who just don't understand that patents uh, are not uh, the equivalent of innovation. There are some patents that can be highly innovative, some patent families that can be highly innovative, uh, but the reality is that they're, they're giving short shrift to what's going on in this world by not understanding, not doing the hard work of understanding that innovation is happening uh, and has broken out in, uh, in, in the software world in a way that, uh, that just doing an analysis of uh, how many patents a, a country has or how many patents a company has uh, is relevant to correlate to their innovativeness. Um, uh, you see studies like this all the time. To their credit, the Linux Foundation is, uh, has uh, retained uh, a, an a, uh, analyst group to be able to do a study to help refute this, uh, uh, this view uh, because it's really hurting us in so many different ways. Um, and it's, uh, it's something that if you look at, micro, uh, at uh, IBM, IBM, this is the first year where they gave up the ghost and said, look, it's not about numerosity, it's about quality. We have to put better quality, have better quality patents, and that's what our investors should be looking at, not the fact that we're the leading inventor in North America or in the US every year for the past 20 years. Uh, and so it, it's, a, it's a, an addiction of a different sort than the one I mentioned earlier, to kind of feed the market, to, to delude the market into thinking, oh yeah, this, is, this indicates you're innovative. Um, they know it's something else. They've known it for a long time. There's lots of really smart people at IBM, um, and they've been trying to carry the burden of, you know, kind of educating people around the world of how important quality is, while at the same time trying to meet these numerical targets. Well, they've given up the numerical targets, and they're focused on where they should be focused on, which is utilizing the capital that they allocate toward, toward innovation based on uh, inventions that are captured in, uh, in patents. Um, uh, in the most effective and efficient way possible to be able to grow their business and build technology uh, on those innovations that they're producing. Um, I'd say that, uh, that universal reciprocity is an attack on OIN, um, this attack from these companies, uh, but it's also an attack on the core values of the community, uh, the open source community, and it really can't be tolerated. Um, and so I have, uh, had multiple visits to DG Comp, DG Grow, uh, to uh, Terry Breton's uh, staff uh, in Brussels as well, um, who's the most uh, well-recognized uh, CEO in, in France, probably in the post-war period, at tech companies anyway, and uh, who's now number two at, uh, at uh, the European Union and in the commission. And he's... Uh, He's not necessarily one who, uh, who sees these things uh, because he's managed several companies in France that were massive producers of revenue associated with monetization, uh, specifically Thompson, which became Technicolor. But nonetheless, he recognizes that, uh, that pat this whole notion of patents equaling innovation is there's something wrong with it because there are many, many, many bad patents and many, many poor quality patents uh, that should have never been granted that uh, do not in any way, should not connote uh, uh, innovation. So the bottom line is that um, unlike traditional patent pools and, and are, that are built around standards like MPEG-LA, uh, used as an example before, what we've shown is that broad-based legal collaboration, uh, universal reciprocity as a model is key to patent risk mitigation and freedom of action and open source. And, uh, uh, and we've really done this um, to, to really show that there are acute parallels between what happens in the tech 
environment with an open source where people are collaborating to compete more effectively uh, and they're collaborating cross-organizationally, cross-functionally. Uh, we are collaborating um, and bringing uh, legal and technical people together to have them recognize that their interests are best served by, by doing, by getting involved in these kinds of, of partnerships to be able to advance everybody's interests. Also, this is a social movement, uh, and it's, it's how we create value in the new economy. And the opportunity, the democratization of innovation that we're really part of goes hand in hand with the obligation. It's the responsibilities that I described earlier in the particular example that I gave. Uh, to, to be a citizen of this community, there are things that are expected of you. Um, and uh, it's something that allows, I'd say it underpins what this community is really about. And ultimately, if you give companies enough time and you, they're, 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 they recognize the importance of open source, uh, the only companies that don't sign the OAN license and participate in this, this social compact that we're all part of are companies that want to reserve the right to sue on core Linux and open source functionality. And these are companies that are, the, they are among the inauthentic and they are antagonistic to all that we're trying to do. These 2,000 people that are, uh, that are out there today roaming around and visiting and, and with each other and the hallway track as well as participating in presentations these people, we're all dependent upon on collaboration and we're all dependent upon uh, the, the set of norms that we've all kind of bought into, whether they be legal or, or, or social uh, in the case of, uh, uh, of, of how we interact with each other and uh, how we uh, share and, and uh, grow innovation together. So thanks very much. Um, I'm glad to talk to anybody afterwards, but I think we're out of time. Thank you.